Okay, I'm Jana Hansen and I go to Weathersfield High School and um, it is the 30th and we are at the Kiwani Public Library and you are? I'm Ellis Joe Stabler, originally from Neponta, Illinois, but I've lived in Kiwani since 1970. Um, where were you born and what year were you born? Born in Kiwani Public Hospital here in Kiwani, Illinois. And November 25th, 1929. Um, who were your parents and what did they do? Uh, my parents was uh, Charles uh, G. Stabler. My mom was Lily Jackson Stabler. Uh, they were farmers that lived just about four miles east of Kiwani on a farm. How many years did they farm? All their life. I mean, you know, and my dad died uh, at the age of 78 and he was born and raised on a farm just about a mile from where he ended up farming. And my mom, she was the youngest of 19 kids. She was a member of the Jackson family. And she was born and raised uh, just about one mile north of Elmira, if anyone knows where Elmira is. Heard of it. Um, did their parents farm? Yes, they did. Is that mm -hmm. how it got passed down? Um, did your siblings ever serve in the military? Uh, I have a brother and a sister. My sister was nine years older than I, which she did not serve in the service. My brother was four years older than I was, and he did serve uh, three years in uh, World War II and was discharged after the uh, signing of the armistice in uh, 1949 or 48, whenever it was, 46, I guess it was. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? Well, it's kind of a long story. Uh, when my brother got out of the service in 1946, uh, why after World War II, why my folks moved into Kiwani, and uh, so I was only 15 years old at that time. I had to register for the draft when I become 16. We lived in Kiwani when I become old enough as I register for the draft, which I registered here in Kiwani, Illinois, with uh, Henry County. I got married in 1950, and like a dummy that I am, I didn't change my draft board from Henry County to Bureau County where we were farming. So when my number came up for the draft, why I went in to ask for a deferment. And this is kind of crude, but the uh, head of the draft board told me, he said, no, I'm not going to defer you because you're married and you got a bunch of corn left out in the field to pick yet. He said, I'm not going to defer you because he said, if I'm going to send someone to Korea to die, he said, I'd rather be someone from uh, Henry County rather than someone, or someone from Bureau County rather than someone from Henry County. So that got me off to a very good start when I enlisted in the Navy. So I enlisted in the Navy in uh, December of 1951. Did you get to choose that branch? Well, that's a story too. I knew the uh, head of the draft board real well because at that time I kept uh, close tabs as to when I might be drafted. The head of the draft board, her name was Shirley Kays. Uh, on uh, Thanksgiving of 1951, I'd already been married for about a year and a half. We had a big snowstorm on Thanksgiving. So the day after Thanksgiving, I went up to the draft board to see, uh, you know, where I was standing for the draft. And she looked up, she saw me coming in, and she said, uh, don't tell me you received it already. And I said, received what? She said, your notice for induction. I said, no, why? I said, uh, she said, well, I just sent it out this morning. So I did not want to spend uh, the winners in a foxhole on Korea, so I said, do I have time to enlist in the Navy? She says, yeah, just don't open up your nose of induction yet. So I was married at the time. I went down and got my wife, and I said, you know, I'm going to be drafted in about uh, two weeks. Should I enlist in the Navy? What do you think? She said, uh, I'd rather you'd be in the Navy rather than in the Army. So that's how I ended up enlisting in the Navy. So they gave me about, uh, well, they, I went to the Navy and uh, enlisted. They said that we got a bunch going on the 4th of December, 
and this was like the 26th or so of November, so I had about uh, eight days to make up my mind to finish up everything and enlist in the Navy. So I, December 4th of 1951, I remember it. I got up that morning, milked uh, nine head of milk cows, fed 200 head of hogs, met the six o'clock train in Kiwani, went to the Great Lakes, and that's where I spent the next four, not, not in Great Lakes, but in the Navy for the next four years. Um, do you recall your instructor, instructors, or like, are, were they harsh or like In that? boot camp? Yeah. If I'd ever meet them again, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, boot camp was pretty rough at that time. That was uh, December, January, and February up at Great Lakes. Of course, they'd get you out in the middle of the night and march in, uh, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning just to see if you could take it, I guess. But uh, no, they, they was harsh, but I mean, that's the way they were in boot camp. Right. Um, did you receive any specialized training? I guess not. They didn't have, a, they didn't need any farmers exactly in the Navy or whatever. But uh, so when I, after I got out of boot camp basic training, why well, I was sent aboard a real small ship and uh, they said that they would need someone in the supply department. Well, that sounded about as good to me. So I said, well, yeah, I know all about supply and they want to know if I could use a typewriter. And I said, oh, you bet I can. I think uh, in high school, I think I got about four words a minute on a typewriter, and that was, that was about it. But, but no, I, I uh, became a storekeeper, as they call them, in the supply department. And that's where I spent the next four years in the uh, supply division. So it seems like you adapted to military life pretty well then, after a while? I hated it. <laughs> well, I was married. And here's another thing that kind of, I should say, teed me off in a way. Uh, at that time, I was married and farming on my own, and some of my friends, because they were college students, they got deferred. And of course, when I went in and asked for a deferment, right, that's when the head of the draft board said, if you're going to send someone to die in a foxhole, you'd rather be someone from uh, Bureau County rather than someone from Henry County. But, but no, I mean, I after, I would say after... It took me a good year to get used to having my mo being away from my wife and being married and being in the Navy and taking orders. When you're a farmer, you most generally never had to take orders from anyone. You could go out and kick a hog in the butt if you wanted to. But when you got to take orders for <laughs> something goofy, why well, it was hard to adjust. But I finally realized I had to, so I did. And it's sort of like, you probably don't, aren't old enough to remember, but Sergeant Bilko used to have a TV show, and he got where he could uh, talk anyone into anything. So after the first year, I thought, I'm here. I got three more years to go. I'm going to work the system the way the best I can. So I've done a pretty good job of it. Did you get any friendships out of being in the service? Good friendships? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny. One of my, two of my closest friends, that I became uh, friends with in the service. One of them was an American Indian. One of them was a, uh, from New Mexico. Celestino Flores was his name, so you know what he was like. And uh, one of the other ones was a, uh, a Lebanese by the name of Fred Shaheen. Those are about the only three guys that I really became close with. and. And I think Fred Shaheen, he lived up in Detroit. Uh, Kenneth Keplinger, he lived out in uh, Oklahoma. And Celestino Flores, I do have to tell you something about him. I met him when I was up on the Aleutian Islands. And, uh, you know, we'd always get care packages from home or something like that. And he was eating these little hot peppers down like crazy. and. He said, they aren't hot, they're just like candy. He said, here, go ahead and take one. Just put it in your mouth and, and take it. I put that sucker in my mouth. I tell you, I never, I think my mouth burnt for three days <laughs> after that or whatever. And he was eating it like candy. But I mean, but no, they would actually be my closest friends. There is one thing that I did happen to run into, and that is my cousin, which we were, we were born three months apart. We grew up together. We went to school together and everything. 
uh, him and I pulled a few liberties over in uh, Korea and out in San Diego when our ship was in San Diego. So I did get to see my cousin quite often. Not really quite often, but maybe once, uh, maybe once every eight months or something like that. His ship was always about, uh, its tour of duty was always about eight months ahead of mine. In other words, when I would go to Korea, why he'd be over there for about a week, we'd get together, and then his ship would come back, and then about the time my ship was ready to come back, why we'd get together in San Diego for a while, then back out to Korea he would go, and so we kept that up for about three years, really. Wow. How'd you stay in touch with your family and friends at home? Big pardon? How'd you stay in touch with your family and friends at home? Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's a lot different than it is now. We would call home when uh, I would, my ship would be in San Diego. My wife would always come out to San Diego and stay. And so on uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas, something like that, we would call home, talk for about uh, three or four minutes, and that was it. Wow. And now, other than that, I would just send letters back and forth. But I mean, you know, anymore they got, what do they call them? I don't even know what they are. The, faxes and all that kind of stuff, but uh, we didn't have that at that time, but so it was either letters or on holidays, special holidays, we would call home and visit with the parents or stuff. What did you do in your free time when you weren't busy with stuff? Well, I guess when my wife was out in San Diego, of course when I was, when she wasn't out there, but Every time I would come back to San Diego from being old, overseas, why we bought an old, uh, like I said, an old uh, 35 Plymouth, paid 75 bucks for it. We never had insurance on it or anything like that. We'd drive the thing down to Tijuana, Mexico, go to the bullfights, uh, you know, and. Uh, we did go up to, got up early one morning and went up to see the Rose Bowl parade. And uh, so, I mean, you know, we we got to see a lot of stuff as far as that goes, When, like when I was in the States. But every time I'd go overseas, then she would most generally come back to Kiwan and she had a good job at the boss office. And then when she was out in San Diego, she worked at uh, Marston's department uh, store, which uh, she had the same kind of booking machine that she worked on here at the boss office that she did when she was out in San Diego. So she got her job, no matter where she's at, they would give her a job. Really now the cool. last time I went overseas, why uh, uh, she decided, well I only had about seven or eight months to go at that time, so she said, I think I can just stay out in San Diego. So at that time, she just got an apartment and stayed out in San Diego for the six or seven months uh, until I got discharged. What was the coolest thing you've seen when you were traveling around? Bullfight, I guess. I mean, all the Mexicans hollering for the uh, for the tour, matador or whatever, and all the sailors there hollering for the bull. So, I mean, <laughs> no, we did get to see lots of things. I mean, you know, and of course, when we were first married, why, I was never outside the state of Illinois. Uh, like I said, uh, so to me, it was just, and to see in the mountains, I'll never forget when we left uh, boot camp, why they took us all out to uh, California on a train, and so many guys, I said, I can't wait to see them damn mountains. I want to see a mountain. And they thought it was so goofy. <coughs> that I didn't see a mountain or anything in my life or whatever. And there's another thing, see, now, being as I was married, I was 22 years old when I went in service. And here's what I always, after every duty station I would be on, after I was there for a while, why the guys would always tell me, you know, you're lucky you didn't get killed. And I said, what do you mean? They said you were so much older than the other recruits. Why, we thought maybe you was a member of the CIA checking checking out Navy guys or whatever. I said, well, I'm glad you found out I wasn't one of those dudes anyway or whatever. But uh, so I had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, after I finally made up my mind, I'm here for four years, I just want well, to make the best of it. Um, where were you when the war ended? The Korean War? Uh, we was over on that first ship I was on. It was an LST, which is 
they make them up here at Seneca on the Illinois River, so you know it's not a very big ship. It's one of those ships that when they'd go into land, why the doors would open in front and all the sailors would go out, you know, and jump out and then, uh, or all the Marines, not us sailors, I wasn't about to do that. That's one reason I joined the Navy. But uh, like I said, then when I left that ship, why then I got to go aboard the, uh, or they sent me up to Adak, Alaska. Now on Adak, Alaska, there's not a town or anything. All it was was a Navy base. And there was about 1,200 sailors up there and no women. And I do have to tell you a cute uh, joke. I was up there on Adak, Alaska, by the, I know that you haven't heard of, maybe some of you have. Terry Moore, she was a uh, movie star at that time during the U.S. back in the 1950s. But anyway, she brought a bunch of uh, USA, USO girls in up there. And I was on watch that night. Now you can believe this if you want to. I kind of stretch the truth a little bit. But I was on watch that night, and this plane landed, and all these beautiful girls got out. I said, you can't bring those girls in here. <coughs> they said, what do you mean? We're USO. And I said, you still can't bring them in here. And they said, why not? I said, these guys have been up here for a year. They haven't seen a woman, hardly. They said, uh, the head uh, lady said, don't worry, these girls got it up here. And I said, I don't know where they got it. These guys are going to find it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, so like I said, I, I tried to make the best of everything I had one thing or another. And uh, after the first eight, nine months, I, that was my worst part, taking orders from someone when I wasn't being a farmer and wasn't used to taking orders from anyone. So when you first heard about the war being over, what did it feel like for you? Oh, I didn't mean to tell you. Uh, that first ship I was on, which was a uh, LST, now down on the tank deck, they always called it a tank deck, when those doors went open, by tanks and everything, you know, we'd haul tanks and everything. When the Korean War ended, why we had a whole bunch of prisoners down in Guam, you know, uh, North Korean prisoners. So we had to go down to Guam and then on that tank deck, which was just about like this huge room, maybe about twice as big as this, they had it petitioned off. They put a bunch of, uh, built a bunch of stalls, you might call it. And they had a hundred prisoners in each stall. And I think we made three or four trips just taking prisoners back and forth. And they were in there about, I'd say about two or three days. So you can about imagine how that spell smelled after <laughs> those guys being in there two or three days. But, so when the war actually ended, by, we were in Korea at that time, and that's when we got to uh, get the job of uh, transporting prisoners back from, uh, well, they used to hold them in Guam and all of those uh, smaller islands down there. Um, how were you received by your family and community when you got back? Like, how did they treat you? I didn't know I was you? gone. <laughs> no. No, it wasn't quite like World War II. Uh, when I left to go to the service, well, of course, in a little town like Neponset, everyone knew I was going, you know, all my farmer friends and everyone like that. But, I mean, uh, when I left to go to the service that morning when we met the 6 o'clock train, well, all it was was my wife, my mom and dad, and I think my wife's folks were there to see me off. and. When we got home, I, when I got home and the war was over with, I, you know, it just came home. That was right. it. Yeah. Um, how did you readjust when you got back? Got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, there wasn't any trouble readjusting at that time. It, it wasn't like, you might say, during World War II, what those people went through when they were gone from home for three or four years, a lot of them. Because, uh, during at that time, even the Korean War, why, when we got, got sent to Korea, now, like I said, there was guys that was in the Army, the Marines, they had it a lot rougher than us sailors did. But the Navy guys, why, uh, they'd uh, rotate us about every six months. In other words, we leave uh, California, and, and then about six months later, seven months or so, they'd bring us back. So, I mean, it wasn't like we were just gone for a year at a time like it was in World War II. Um, have you been involved in any veterans organizations? Well, <clears throat> when I came home, 
Naturally, I joined the uh, VFW, uh, joined the uh, American Legion. Uh, up at Neponset, uh, the American Legion always used to have what they'd call stags. A lot of guys would go out west hunting. They'd get bear meat, or they'd shoot bear and deer and antelope and everything. They'd bring it back, and then we'd have what they'd call big stags at that time. In other words, guys come in and they would uh, play cards all night long. And of course, always used to have to help that. So finally, after about four or five years, I got tired of staying up all night when I had cows to milk and everything like that. So I dropped the Legion. I didn't pay my dues for quite a while. So then uh, my wife kind of talked me into uh, joining the uh, Legion again. Well, like a dummy, I got notice for, you know, to pay my Legion dues. So I just sent in my Legion dues about four years as a member down in Bloomington. Because I didn't realize that, you know, I just figured I'd be a member of Kiwani. So then I transferred up to uh, Kiwani. And uh, I really haven't been that involved other than the last 20 years since I've been retired. I'm involved with the uh, Veterans Council. We do all the military funerals. Matter of fact, we have one tomorrow. Anyone that was in the service. And it's really. You know, it's one of the best things I think or whatever, and Jerry Rucks and the Schoenemans, you know, they always handle the funerals, and they always say that Kiwani uh, Veterans Council has the best veterans uh, funerals around right now. Uh, when we, you know, if it's one of ours, why it's really special, you know, if one of our guys, uh, but uh, when we go to the funeral, why we all line up and then we'll go in and uh, pay uh, respects to the widow or the family and one thing or another. Then during the funeral, <coughs> why we'll sit there in our uh, separate area and then we all go up and salute uh, the casket or the remains, whichever it might be. And then uh, we go outside or up to the cemetery, wherever they want us. It's not lots of times they don't go to the cemetery. But they'll just go outside and we'll have the 21 gun salute outside, you know, the funeral home. And here's what kind of gets me. Uh, we do lots of, quite a few funerals for people who want to be buried over to the arsenal. Uh, if it's uh, someone from Kiwani or Nipontet or someone like that, we will go over and do the funeral. But if, if we don't go over and do it, they play taps on a on boom box. They don't even have a bugler come out. They play taps on a boom box, and then they don't even have a firing squad. I guess they, you can hire them or something, I don't know, but most generally they don't have any. But, but we always like to go over and do our own. And then uh, uh, after the funeral and after we've done the 21-gun salute, we always go back to the Legion Hall, uh, clean the guns, reload them, and get everything ready for another funeral. And then we all sit at the bar and uh, I'm sorry about gets to me. I'm okay. okay. Um, how did the wartime experiences affect your life? Yeah, other than taking four years out of my uh, married life, I guess, uh, you know, it, after after we got over it, why, it's fine. Um, what are some life lessons that you learned from the service? You got to take orders when they tell <laughs> When they tell you take orders, you better take orders, I guess. But, but no, it, it, it does everyone good, I think, and I've always said, I think everyone should spend at least a year in the service or whatever. Um, how has the military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, I guess we've always had wars, and I guess we probably always will. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it. I guess what bothers me more than anything is how uh, so many people anymore don't respect the servicemen. Uh, I got another little story, you know, uh, here a few years ago, my wife and I joined the, uh, well, we've always joined the church, we go every Sunday, 
but we aren't that involved. She's not a Methodist woman, and I've never been a Methodist man, but so we joined an organization here not too long ago, thinking that we ought to be involved a little bit. So we start going to it, and every uh, they meet once a month on Wednesday night, and after they'd say a little prayer, why they'd start eating, I'd say, I think you forgot something. What did we forget? I said, you forgot to remember the uh, servicemen and ladies that are overseas. And, uh, oh, I guess we did, didn't we? That went on for about three or four months, and I thought, if they can't remember that, then I, I just quit. So what message would you leave for future generations who will view slash hear this interview? Big pardon. What, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view slash hear this interview? Well, I would still say it. At least a year in the service wouldn't hurt anyone, and that is men and ladies both. I mean, the funniest part is I tried to talk. I got three daughters, and I tried to talk them into joining the service, and I couldn't do it. Um, is there anything that you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? No, I thought you'd done a very good job. Yeah. Thank you. And probably better than I did as far as that goes. <laughs> but, uh, but no, like I said, I tell you, just when we get through with the funeral, we always go back and we toast the guy we lose. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. When I went overseas on my first trip aboard that smaller ship that goes over, which is only like, uh, it's only about 140 foot long. Well, and then I went to Adak, Alaska. Now, that's clear out on the Aleutian chain, and it's 12 miles from Russia. And all it is is, uh, it was just a Navy base there, and that was it, no town or anything. Well, I, when they send you out there, you're there for a year. I spent a full year out there. And then when I came back, well, I had orders to go aboard an aircraft carrier. So I went aboard an aircraft carrier and we were the first aircraft carrier to take a jet squadron uh, on. And uh, you know, to see those jets taken off on, uh, you know, off that aircraft carrier or even come in on landing, it just runs chills up and down your, your backbone or whatever. And being we was the first uh, aircraft carrier to take uh, air jet squadrons aboard, why, uh, there was, I think in the first uh, four months, we lost four pilots because they weren't used to coming in and landing on that, on an aircraft carrier that's floating up and down. I think we lost four uh, pilots in the first uh, three or four months that we had them. What are your kids' reasoning for not wanting to go and serve? Anymore? No draft. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the days where they used to have the draft, and then they'd done away with the draft. So, so just the uh, fact they don't have to? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about kids just going to serve for college? Like, a lot of times they'll offer help with college if you go serve. There's a lot of kids that I know that do that. I know a lot of kids have done that. I mean, uh, but Jim Goby's son, you know, he went through West Point. I mean, you know, on a scholarship and one thing or another. But, no, a lot of people have got a lot of good, uh, good vacation or not vacation, but uh, right. yes, but uh, I think it it really doesn't hurt anyone. And what gets me anymore is you know at home I got a Kiwani put out a booklet here about uh, three or four years ago. You know the people could put their pictures in there, uh, you know, that served in the service, and I was surprised at how many. Young ladies have served in the nurse corps and the, in the uh, Navy and the Army and everything like that, you know. So about once every two months I get out that book and thumb through it just to look at all the people. How many people do you know that are currently serving? Well, probably uh, if I had to name them off, I probably couldn't think only about eight or ten really. Have they told I, mean, you? I, I could name off a lot of that did serve, I mean, you know, for the right. three or four years or whatever like that, and then they'd get their discharge. And... Have you asked them to see if that, like, the way they serve is different from the way that you served? Like, if there's different well, things? It's a lot different, let's face it. When you, if you're aboard ship nowadays and you'd walk out of a, uh, 
a porthole or look out a porthole and see a young lady out there. Well, you know, it's a lot different than it used to be when right. I was in the service. But uh, but no, like I said, I I really think that these young ladies uh, that joined the service and nurse corps and everything like that, they and I know a lot of them. And they came out, and matter of fact, I volunteer at the hospital every Monday afternoon. I have for 30-some uh, years, and a lot of the nurses out there I know have spent time in the service, and uh, so I really envy them there in a way. Do you think that businesses, um, more businesses should have veterans work over younger people? Well, I don't know really what it's like anymore. I hear. I do know that VAs don't take care of the veterans the way they should, but uh, as far as the young veterans going out and getting work, I don't know. I, I don't think they get much preference off of, uh, uh, you know, I suppose they look at college degrees and the degrees that they need, and, uh, but, uh, but no, it's too bad that they don't give them more preference, but then if they don't have the qualifications, well, I guess that makes a difference. Right. Um, okay. All right. Thank you for coming out today and on March 30th, 2017, and telling us your story. Mm -hmm.